In finding your own place in the world, you should analyze yourself and find out whether you are a dynamo or a balance wheel and select a definite chief aim for yourself that harmonizes with your native ability. If you are in business with others, you should analyze them as well as yourself and endeavor to see that each person takes the part for which his temperament and native ability best fit him. Stating it another way, people may be classified under two headings. One is the promoter and the other is the caretaker. The promoter type makes an able salesman and organizer. The caretaker type makes an excellent conserver of assets after they have been accumulated. Place the caretaker type in charge of a set of books and he is happy. But place him on the outside selling and he is unhappy and will be a failure at his job. Place the promoter in charge of a set of books and he will be miserable. His nature demands more intense action. Action of the passive type will not satisfy his ambitions. And if he is kept at work which does not give him the action his nature demands, he will be a failure. It very frequently turns out that men who embezzle funds in their charge are of the promoter type, and they would not have yielded to temptation had their efforts been confined to the work for which they are best fitted. Give a man the sort of work that harmonizes with his nature, and the best there is in him will exert itself. One of the outstanding tragedies of the world is the fact that most people never engage in the work for which they are best fitted by nature. Too often the mistake is made in the selection of a life work, of engaging in the work which seems to be the most profitable from a monetary viewpoint, without consideration of native ability. If money alone brought success, this procedure would be all right, but success in its highest and noblest form calls for peace of mind and enjoyment and happiness, which comes only to the man who has found the work that he likes best. The main purpose of this course is to help you analyze yourself and determine what your native ability best fits you to do. We come now to the discussion of the principle through which action may be developed. To understand how to become active requires understanding of how not to procrastinate. These suggestions will give you the necessary instructions. First, form the habit of doing each day the most distasteful tasks first. This procedure will be difficult at first, but after you have formed the habit, you will take pride in pitching into the hardest and most undesirable part of your work first. Second, place this sign in front of you where you can see it in your daily work and put a copy in your bedroom where it will greet you as you retire and when you arise. Do not tell them what you can do. Show them. Third, repeat the following words aloud twelve times each night just before you go to sleep. Tomorrow I will do everything that should be done, when it should be done, and as it should be done. I will perform the most difficult tasks first, because this will destroy the habit of procrastination and develop the habit of action in its place. Fourth, carry out these instructions with faith in their soundness and with belief that they will develop action, in body and in mind, sufficient to enable you to realize your definite chief aim. The outstanding feature of this course is the simplicity of the style in which it is written. All great fundamental truths are simple in final analysis, and whether one is delivering an address or writing a course of instruction, the purpose should be to convey impressions and statements of fact in the clearest and most concise manner possible. Before closing this lesson, permit me to go back to what was said about the value of a hearty laugh as a healthful stimulant to action and add the statement that singing produces the same effect and in some instances is far preferable to laughing. Billy Sunday is one of the most dynamic and active preachers in the world, yet it has been said that his sermons would lose much of their effectiveness if it were not for the psychological effect of his song services. It is a well-known fact that the German army was a winning army at the beginning and long after the beginning of the World War, and it has been said that much of this was due to the fact that the German army was a singing army. Then came the khaki-clad doughboys from America, and they too were singers. Back of their singing was an enduring faith in the cause for which they were fighting. Soon the Germans began to quit singing, and as they did so, the tide of war began to turn against them. If church attendance had nothing else to recommend it except the psychological effect of the song service, that would be sufficient. 
for no one can join in the singing of a beautiful hymn without feeling better for it. For many years I have observed that I could write more effectively after having participated in a song service. Prove my statement to your own satisfaction by going to church next Sunday morning and participating in the song service with all the enthusiasm at your command. During the war I helped devise ways and means of speeding production in industrial plants that were engaged in manufacturing war supplies. By actual test, in a plant employing 3,000 men and women, the production was increased 45% in less than 30 days after we had organized the workers into singing groups and installed orchestras and bands that played at ten-minute intervals such stirring songs as Over There and Dixie and There'll Be a Hot Time in the Old Town Tonight. The workers caught the rhythm of the music and speeded up their work accordingly. Properly selected music would stimulate any class of workers to greater action, a fact which does not seem to be understood by all who direct the efforts of large numbers of people. In all my travels I have found but one business firm whose managers made use of music as a stimulant for their workers. This was the Filene Department Store in Boston, Massachusetts. During the summer months this store provides an orchestra that plays the latest dance music for half an hour before opening time in the morning. The salespeople use the aisles of the store for dancing, and by the time the doors are thrown open they are in an active state of mind and body that carries them through the entire day. Incidentally, I have never seen more courteous or efficient salespeople than those employed by the Filene store. One of the department managers told me that every person in his department performed more service and with less real effort as a result of the morning music program. A singing army is a winning army, whether on the field of battle, in warfare, or behind the counters in a department store. There is a book entitled Singing Through Life with God by George Wharton James, which I recommend to all who are interested in the psychology of song. If I were the manager of an industrial plant in which the work was heavy and monotonous, I would install some sort of musical program that would supply every worker with music. On Lower Broadway in New York City, an ingenious Greek has discovered how to entertain his customers and at the same time speed up the work of his helpers by the use of a phonograph. Every boy in the place keeps time with the music as he draws the cloth across the shoes and seems to get considerable fun out of his work in doing so. To speed up the work, the proprietor has but to speed up the phonograph.